Science has not buried God, it has revealed him, and with it buried materialism. You need to shut the fuck up! Hello all, I apologize for my hiatus, I've been dealing with a lot of personal issues, and I've also been very busy lately. This video will be primarily devoted to the hard problem of consciousness, but first I will quickly finish the disillusionment that some YouTube idealists have about quantum mechanics. So IP decided to reply to me and address what I said in my previous video concerning quantum mechanics and materialism. So let's explore this new production of Theistic Fuck Tartar. So right off the bat, IP is whining that I use name calling and ad hominem attacks. His argument is that because I called some of his physicists that he talked about in the video fringe quacks, I'm actually ducking what they have to say. He says, quote, calling someone a fringe quack is not an argument, unquote. Well, actually, it is if the person you're citing is spewing fringe quackery. There's a reason geologists do not take Kurt Wise seriously, and there's a reason that astronomers and astrophysicists do not take Emanuel Velikovsky seriously. It wasn't so much name calling as it was calling out bullshit, so let's dive into the meat of his criticisms. So IP agrees with me that it cannot be a human observer that collapses the wave function. This is good, I'll count this as progress for now. He goes on to say that he will get into what he means by an observer later in the response, so I'll look forward to that. IP is now whining about how the von Neumann chain shows that a mind is ultimately necessary for interaction. What IP doesn't understand is that the use of the von Neumann chain is essentially defunct because most physicists realize that the interaction with the photon detector is what causes wave function collapse. IP is appealing to the strong von Neumann projection postulate that says that collapse is constituted by a sharp transition to the outcome of a particular measurement rather than an outcome produced by the change in the entire wave function. The von Neumann chain comes from the early days of quantum mechanics wherein most experiments were devoted towards scattering spectroscopy. The von Neumann chain also requires that the measurement is prepared after the experiment rather than before the experiment. That is, the measurement to which a particular observable yields is prepared after the experiment has already happened rather than before in the case of when the experiment would change the wave function. Also, the use of the von Neumann chain sharply undercuts the precision of quantum mechanical measurements because it requires a sharp change in measurement values for observables as a result of measurement rather than a dispositional change in measurement values as a result of the change in wave function which changes the probability density. Finally, concerning the von Neumann chain, the applicability of this postulate barely functions when dealing with an individual particle, let alone a grand canonical ensemble as IP would have us believe. It only works if you assume randomness, as physicist Paul Drew did with his model of metals. The problem with this, however, is that it does not take into account any sort of environmental effect on the particle. As physicist Lawrence Krauss notes, well, I just want to correct Lawrence an Krauss error that, I mean, I'm, I don't think you meant it, Ian, Lawrence so Krauss. I want to just make it clear. The laws of physics are deterministic. The Schrodinger equation, which is the basis of quantum mechanics, is a second order differential equation. And therefore, the laws are deterministic. Our observations aren't deterministic, but the underlying laws are deterministic. Nothing's changed in, in, in 400 years. And so it's really well, important the to recognize there's no way... Isn't the, the universe isn't, dis isn't deterministic. Wait a minute. Uh, I, it's governed I, by quantum mechanics. Just one thing, um, because we got into four syllables and I'm not that smart. Um, <laughs> just give us a working definition yeah. of the word deterministic. You, you, you mean... You, you it, start it, with an initial an condition for the equations of quantum mechanics, and the, and the evolution of the system is determined unambiguously. It has no to happen. no uncertainty. Your measurement of the system has uncertainty, but the evolution of the underlying uh, system know, is completely I'll, determined. I'll, I'll... IP quotes physicist Stephen Barr here, who says that we cannot calculate the definite result, but only probabilities. The problem with this, however, is that the result is determined by the initial condition. The definite result cannot emerge from calculation simply because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Although the many worlds interpretation cannot derive the Born rule, which gives the probability of a particular measurement outcome, the application of Bayesian probability and statistics allows for probabilities wherein one is likely to find the particle. For the quantum mechanical interpretation that uses Bayesian probability, physicists Christopher Fuchs and Rudiger Schock have referred to their current approach to the quantum Bayesian program as cubism. On a technical level, Q 
Cubism uses symmetric, informationally complete, positive operator valued measures, or SIC problems, to rewrite quantum states, either pure or mixed, as a set of probabilities defined over the outcomes of a, quote, Bureau of Standards, unquote, measurement. That is, if one translates a density matrix into a probability distribution over the outcomes of a sick problem experiment, one can reproduce all the statistical predictions normally computed by using the Born rule on the density matrix from the sick problem probabilities instead. The Born rule then takes on the function of relating one valid probability distribution to another rather than of deriving probabilities from something apparently more fundamental. This application of Bayesianism is an extension of the law of total probability as it allows for a matrix of operators that take into account the current conditions and translates the wave function into statistical averages of the likelihood of a particular measurement outcome. IP's next objection is that the environment cannot choose between probabilities, to which I respond by referring back to my last video saying, The wave function does not have a physical reality, it's just a mathematical model that describes the expectation values of particular observables of a quantum particle or system. The act of observing does not change the particle. The act of observing allows for greater precision as to the actual state of the particle but it is not as if the particle didn't have any properties prior to measurement. It just means that you must perturb the particle in some fashion, as I have just described, in order to know its actual properties rather than what is described by the wave function. If you've noticed a pattern, IP is quoting some of the early pioneers of quantum mechanics. Henry Stapp, John von Neumann, Niels Bohr, Max Planck, Eugene Wigner. All of these people were new to quantum mechanics and they did not know much about it as we do today. So to quote them as if their ideas and speculations hold sway, given what we know about quantum mechanics, is very disingenuous. Here's Sean Carroll explaining how many people get caught up in what the early pioneers of this field had to say. But, Sean, but what, Sean, what Sean was saying to you was that you're basically saying it, it, there, there just cannot be any other explanation other than the one that I have, and therefore science really isn't relevant at this point. I think that, uh, si that in my view, this is all about how understanding the, tr the true nature of consciousness, uh, soul and spirit, has a lot to do with helping to take physics to the next level in terms of understanding okay. the Thanks. nature Sean, of quantum mechanics. The thing about Einstein, Bohr, de Broglie, etc., the founders of quantum mechanics, is that they're all dead, and they've been dead for many decades. And we know what's going on much better now than we did back then. They were inventing quantum mechanics, and occasionally they toyed with the idea that somehow consciousness had something to do with the fundamental laws of quantum mechanics. Now we know better. We know how the laws of quantum mechanics help explain how electrons move in the brain, and there's take, take, nothing take in there. Take 15 seconds and tell us why quantum mechanics has been brought up by your opponent, why that has relevance here. Well, it's, I can only quote uh, MIT physicist Scott Aronson, who says, as far as he can tell, quantum mechanics is confusing and consciousness is confusing, so maybe they're the same. <laughs> when physicists say that the particle had properties prior to measurement, what they mean is that the values of the observable that they're measuring is fundamentally fuzzy and uncertain from our perspective because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. This is a source of many misunderstandings IP has in his response to my video. By the way, I'll actually admit that I was wrong in my characterization of Bernard Heisch. I was in a rush and I quoted what I thought he actually meant. However, this does not mean that my objections that I have made so far to IP's response don't hold. The atom is not the same as its wave function. And Johann and Rotz, the Scientific American article that you cited in your response to Martimer 81 did not say that the wave function exists in the sense that you think it does. Here's a word of advice. Read an actual textbook rather than quote people who have far out ideas that you think are cool. The reason your measurement gives the particle a definite position is because you perturbed it and therefore eliminated the uncertainty in the particle's position, momentum, or speed, or whatever. Here's Victor Stenger on For Good Reason with DJ Growth talking about this very problem. 
Well, well, Vic, you you don't deny wave particle dualism. No, but it's just two ways of describing the same reality. And I like uh, I use the example of you know uh, in, that engineers uh, are very familiar with, and that is you know if you have some electronic signal. An electromagnetic signal, which you know, for radio, TV, cell phone, it has a variation with time, and that's that's where the information comes from, from the way it varies with time. It can be a series of pulses and so on. But what they can do is they there's a there's a mathematical procedure called the Fourier transform, in, in which you change that time series to a frequency spectrum. And that often turns out to be a more useful representation of the signal because it can tell you what bandwidth you need and your detectors and so on. Anyway, anybody, anybody who's had any familiarity with, with uh, electromagnetic signals uh, will see that. And all you're doing is you're changing your description of it. In one case, it's a particle-like description, your time series of pulses, let's say. In the, in the other case, it's a wave-like description when you're looking at a, a frequency uh, spectrum. But the description doesn't change the thing being described. Exactly. It's just more called a complementarity. There's two complementary ways you can describe phenomena, either, either as a particle or as a wave. That doesn't mean it's a particle in one case and a wave in the other case. In fact, there are experiments now that you can do, uh, like the double slit experiment that mm -hmm. is supposed to be something that you use to measure wave property, but you can, if you do it with accurate enough equipment, you can measure individual photons, particles, so you can have particles and waves in the same, the same experiment. They're the, they're the same phenomenon. It's a single phenomenon that's just described uh, mathematically one way or the other, measured one way or the other. You measure one thing, or you emphasize one thing, or you, you measure, uh, you, you, you want the position of the thing, so you're measuring a particle property. But if instead you want the frequency of the thing, then you measure a wave property, and there it's just the two different aspects of the same phenomenon. Mm. So these quantum spiritualists, uh, they get half of it right, right? So they actually are talking about you look at it this way uh, at the quantum level. You get waves. Sometimes you get particles, depending on what you measure. All of that's accurate. Yeah, um, and the conscious you're consciously make. The, the scientist or the engineer who's doing this is making a conscious decision to describe it one way or the other. Suppose you're taking a photograph of a chair. You can take it from one angle, and you can move and take it from a second angle. But it's still the same chair. Same okay, chair. so my question here is, they get it half right. Um, do you think that they just misunderstand the implications of this, or are, are they just hucksters making a buck on the confusion among the masses when it comes to quantum physics, like they're – they're hyping it up to make it seem like spirituality. In, in other words, I wouldn't need a hazard to guess at the motivations of. Well, these you folks. know how this thing business works. It's the same thing with all aspects of religion. Uh, there is a huge propaganda machine out there uh, that uh, keeps saying one thing, and after all that, after you hear it enough, uh, it becomes a truth, mm. and, and that's the way it is. These people have heard this. The people who believe this have heard so much of it that they think it must be true. You're goddamn right. Hopefully, this clarifies the perceived contradiction between what I said in the first half of the video and what I said after the clip with Anton Zeilinger, who, I must stress, did not mention mind or consciousness in the paper that IP cites. The rest of the response is just IP in a hissy fit because I was apparently too insulting. Well, I don't take anything I said back. He deserves insults for misrepresenting a field about which lay people know very little and trying to use it to argue for his spaceless, timeless sky wizard. I'll let Matt Dillahunty take it from here. You can do as many experiments as you want, but there is no variable for God. There is no variable for, hey, this is God. How do we plug that into an equation? This is philosophical conjecturing based on quantum physics. 